easy first question. What brought you to the study of mushrooms? What brought me to the study of mushrooms? <laughs> well, first I would have, my first memories are when my parents told me not to uh, step on puffballs because the spores would make my twin brother blind. Um, telling a five-year-old uh, son that gave me ready ammunition to pelt my twin brother with puffballs at every opportunity. And we both suffer from bad eyesight. It's not related to puffballs, but when parents tell children that something's forbidden, then it increases the mystery. And because I was mischievous and interested and spent a lot of times in the woods and outside, um, putting that information to good use was, was uh, very appropriate for my brother and I. Secondarily, I mean, I really became impassioned about mushrooms because I have a stuttering habit. And I went through six or seven years of speech therapy. And I literally could not speak a single sentence in a minute. Uh, my stammering habit was just incredibly profound. And as an advice to people who are around stutterers, don't finish their sentences. Oftentimes stutterers, they're thinking many sentences downstream. And so when I was about 17 or 18 years of age, I took a massive dose of psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, and I was by myself and there was a storm approaching. And I climbed up this large tree during this wind and lightning storm. And it was a terrifying experience because I had never done mushrooms before. And I was up in this tree in 40, 50 mile hour winds and rain and lightning cackling all over around me. And I was terrified. I mean, I was literally, the tree was going back four or five feet back and forth in the wind. And there's lots of, lots of lightning strikes all around me. I was really scared. But I thought, since I'm up there and I can't get down, I wasn't safe, what am I gonna do? And I thought to myself, I should really focus on that which I have the biggest problem personally. And that was my inability to communicate. And so even though six or seven years of speech therapy did me, uh, no, <laughs> gave me no advantage. Um, actually, they wanted to put me in a special education class which was devastating to my ego. And so during this mushroom experience, I thought to myself, why don't I just stop stuttering now? And that became my mantra for about four or five hours. And the storm passed and, and I kept on repeating that to myself. And I came down out of the tree and the next day I stopped stuttering. So that was my empowerment. And I realized that mushrooms were my sort of, uh, what nature has given me to empower my ability to communicate. I still do stutter occasionally, um, but it's nothing like it was before, which was yeah, a major um, handicap that I had. That's an incredible, an incredible story. <laughs> so our next question is the one you, you've prepared for, which is what are, what are mushrooms? Because when I read your book, it became very apparent to me that I really didn't know really what a mushroom was. You know, how do they grow? and what constitutes the organism and how does it work? Well, this is an example of a subject that the more you study it, the more you realize there is to know and that you did not know. And science is rapidly evolving and it's understanding. Um, the Earth is going through its sixth major extinction. This is the sixth great extinction that's been um, uh, identified thus far. And I'd like to talk about two of the prior extinctions. We're in the middle of the sixth extinction. We are probably the, uh, the people or the organisms that are responsible for it, the forces that are causing it. 465 million years ago, we shared a common ancestry with fungi. Basically, life hit the beach from the ocean. Land masses had virtually no life whatsoever. Our fungal ancestors um, came to the beach and then there was a divergence. We actually are mushroom people. We came from fungi. Fungi are our ancestors. Our, our fungal ancestors that went overland in order to protect us, uh, the cells from dehydration and exposure to sunlight became multicellular. And then our, our animal ancestors, or the lineage that gave rise to animals, encapsulated this nutrients uh, by encircling uh, food with a cellular sac, basically a stomach, and produces enzymes and acids uh, that would digest the food. The fungi uh, went, became filamentous and produced these long linear chains that look like cobwebs. They're only one cell wall thick, but they're linear and they diverge and they form this matrix of cells. And they went underground. And so 465 million years ago, as life evolved on land, then the, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a tremendous species diversification. 250 million years ago, at the boundary of the Permian and the Triassic period, a, a giant asteroid or a comet 
Uh, some people postulate there are uh, volcanoes that, that uh, uh, blew up in uh, uh, Siberia. The, the two may be related, we don't know. But we do know the entire Earth was shrouded in a layer of dust, and this can be seen in the geologic record. That was the uh, third mass extinction of species on the planet and the most significant. Over 90% of the species on the planet became extinct at the border of the Permian and the Triassic periods. When the meteor or comet or asteroid hit the Earth, then the, the massive explosion occurred and the Earth became shrouded in dust. Virtually so all sunlight was cut off. We don't know if it was for months or for years or for decades. But in any event, because there was no light that was reaching to the ground, there was a massive die-off of plants. And the fungi, of course, required no light. The plants that associated with fungi were able to get sugars and nutrients with the fungi, so there's a natural selective pressure from that catastrophic event for symbiosis between fungi and plants. Then we march forward after the, uh, the sky is cleared. Then there's more speciation, plants were reborn, uh, symbioses were rewarded, and we march forward into a very diverse species land, uh, landscape. Until 65 million years ago, as most people know, we had another impact, another catastrophic event, which caused another massive extinction. And again, fungi inherited the earth. The earth was shrouded in darkness and dust. And then from these fungal fragments and th these microbial communities and plant communities, after the 65 million years ago, from that impact, the largest uh, animals that survived were small voles, which are very mycophilic. Uh, they actually consume fungi as a food source. Fungi respire uh, a carbon dioxide and inhale oxygen just like we do. We have a more common ancestry with fungi than we do with any other kingdom. As speciation then occurred, um, then a, as the uh, life systems were reborn, then the species diversity of fungi just blossomed. To date, we know there's one to two million species of fungi in the world, uh, in the kingdom. About 10% are mushrooms. These are producing the, the visible fleshy fungi, uh, which most people are, are familiar with. We know about 10% of the kingdom are mushrooms, about 150,000 species. We've only identified 14,000 species to date, which means our ignorance exceeds our knowledge by at least one order of magnitude. In the recent article in the Journal of Eukaryotic Biology, 27 eukaryotic evolutionary biologists have created a new uh, map, basically, of the kingdoms. And they've erected a new super kingdom. And fungi and animals are in the same kingdom. And the, ki and the king kingdom is called Opistocanta. And Opistocanta is the super kingdom that unifies uh, animals and fungi because animals literally came from fungi. These vast and cellular networks are, are massive. The largest organism in the world now has been identified as a mycelial mat. This is the co fine cobwebby like filaments that you see. You just go to any piece of wood on the ground and kick it over. You can see it everywhere. And the largest organism is in eastern Oregon. It's 2,200 acres in size, over 2,400 uh, years old. It has climaxed the forest uh, many times over. 10, 15,000 years ago, at the end of the last uh, uh, ice age, as the glaciers receded, they scraped off the soil and flushed it into the ocean as the, as the glaciers melted. Anyone who's been, been around glaciers, you know there's lots of moraine beds and there's gravel bars and there's basically rock without soil. Small lenses survived. And these small lenses became islands of biodiversity. And the plant communities would grow up and they would climax and the fungi would rot them and then soil would be created. Fungi are the grand molecular disassemblers in nature. They're the interface organisms between life and death. They generate soil. As these lenses of soil expanded, then they had a greater carrying capacity for more biodiversity and more species proliferated. And then they would climax the plants and animals. They would die. Fungi would recycle them. More soil would be produced. The soil would be get thicker. The lens would become larger. Indeed, the entire food web of nature is based on these fungal filaments. The mycelial network that infuses all land masses in the world is a supportive membrane upon which life proliferates and, it, and further diversifies. I've often thought that if there was a united organization of, of organisms, otherwise uh, known as uh-oh, <laughs> and every organism had a vote, would we be voted off the planet? And I think there is a chorus of voices from the microbial world 
And from the natural world, that is voting right now. And the rule of nature is that when a species exceeds the carrying capacity of its environment, diseases proliferate. Populations that have, that have gone, to, gone become too large, that climax and famine, disease, maybe war, occur in order to knock down the population back to, to a level where the environment can carry that population without devastating the underlying biological community. We are here today because of a series of evolutionary successes, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be here tomorrow. And if you look in the crystal ball of this planet, we may well have the future that looks like Mars. And that as the ecosystems collapse because of, the, of, of our disrespect or, uh, and not being a responsible citizen in this biological community on this planet, then uh, the ecosystem can unravel. What we don't know is at what point that we, when we lose biodiversity, that the system will start to fall apart. Now, I believe in the resilience of nature, so I think that once the human species becomes extinct, and many species have become extinct before us, many species will come, become extinct after us, that the, the Earth may well spin on its axis happily without humans, and the microbes and the insects will inherit the world, unless we cause such a dramatic climate shift that we become an arid, cold planet like Mars. If you look at the number of stars in our galaxy, and mathematicians have already postulated this, and it's a mathematical proof at this point. There'll be hundreds of planets the size of Earth at a distance equal to uh, our Earth's distance to our Sun. There'll be hundreds of planets the, the size of Earth uh, of a similar distance to a star like our Sun, which means that liquid water is likely to occur. I have no doubt that life is proliferated throughout the universe, and that our time now may be recorded in the history of the universe as a small footnote of an evolutionary experiment that's gone awry. That's wonderful. <sighs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> that started with water. <laughs> 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 what are mushrooms? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> well, did you know that you were you came from fungus? I had no idea. I yeah. had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope I don't have to repeat that because I don't think I could. <laughs> so, okay. Now, can I put on my hat without interfering with the light? Let's see. Do you want the That's a mushroom hat here. There are many things about mushrooms that are fascinating. Um, one of the things that I found to be really fascinating is that mushrooms can make hats. And this is a hat that is made from this mushroom. This mushroom, the Latin name is called Fomis fomentarius. It is a tinder mushroom. This mushroom is literally why the migration from Africa, and there's no doubt that we're, we all originated in Africa. We are all, all Africans. And as we migrated into Europe, we discovered something new called winter. <laughs> and if your clan did, could not have uh, fire available, the clan would die out, obviously. So the fire keeper, even today, in many uh, tribes, is a very re revered and important position. Well, this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. And you can hollow this mushroom out, put embers of a, of a fire or coals in it, and then you can uh, carry fire literally, literally for days. And you can blow into this after you uncork it and rekindle it. Well, our ancestors found that this mushroom, and I think it's true with many plants, and uh, what, when they have a multiplicity of, uh, of useful uh, attributes, then they become shamanistically important, not just because of one. This mushroom has very strong antimicrobial properties. When you boil this mushroom and you pound it, then you, it separates into fibers. Yeah. So this hat came from this mushroom. And this mushroom is called Fomis fomentarius. And our ancestors realized that when you boil this mushroom, it gives an antimicrobial or a preservative effect to foods, especially in soups, if there's meats involved, etc. If you pound this mushroom after it's been boiled in water, it separates into a fabric. And actually, this fabric is mycelium. And so the mycelium generates a mushroom, the mushroom grows into mycelium. It's just a revolving sort of circle. Our ancestors having the portability of fire allowed us to be migrate into Europe. And of course, as winter set in, we tried to find caves. Well, unfortunately, cave bears were there for millions of years. And so, you know, caves uh, uh, be became a sort of battleground between humans and cave bears. Um, 
the cave bears being uh, effective predators, in order to fight the cave bears and get them out of the caves, then the communities had to develop and sort of uh, you know, preventing the bears from either entering the cave or keeping the bears, uh, 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 or getting the bears out of the caves. So this mushroom is one example of many that um, is actually has been instrumental to the survival of humans as we've migrated uh, uh, across the land masses. 10,000 years ago, we were forced, pe forced people. We had intimate contact with nature. Today, we're in cars, we're on freeways, we're in buildings that are artificial. And way back when, we had an intimate knowledge of nature. And I dare say that even though our scientific knowledge, quote unquote, is has been uh, is more advanced in many ways we've lost a lot of the ancestral knowledge that was instrumental to our very survival when you consider the size of the mycelium and these mushrooms this is called a wood conch and they grow on trees they're called shelf fungi or hoof fungi they're really hard they're hard like wood and so they're not easily di di digestible but because of their, their usefulness in carrying fire, and it was found when you boiled these mushrooms, you would preserve food. And of course, souring food meant you would have to go out and hunt more and gather more, so having food that be preserved was really important. There are other wood conch mushrooms that are, that are equally as fascinating. And this is one that I'm particularly excited about. It's called a garricon. The Latin name is Fomitopsis officinalis. 2,000 years ago, Dioscorides first described it in the very first Materia Medica as a treatment against consumption, later to be known as tuberculosis. It was, a, it was associated primarily with women and uh, women herbalists. And this mushroom is now thought to be extinct in Europe, or nearly extinct. It's illegal to pick it in most countries. It is exclusive to the old growth forests. And since Europe doesn't have very few old growth forests now, or if any, um, this is why it's not there. We still have it in Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and in British Columbia. Two and a half years ago, I, um, in response to the BioShield program, the US Defense Department, uh, we started sending in our strains of mushrooms. Uh, we have over 250 strains in culture. We submitted over 150 strains for analysis in the BioShield program, specifically to see if there is activity against viruses, in particular smallpox. The single most threat uh, that the U.S. Def Defense Department has identified is bioterrorism. As bad as it sounds, if a nuclear weapon exploded in Boston, it would not shut down airplane travel between Seattle and Los Angeles. A bioterrorist attack would. And we began to receive research results, and lo and behold, this mushroom has found out, been found by the BioShield program, the U.S. Defense Department, or our cultures of it, to be highly effective against pox viruses. Cowpox, vaccinia, and the word uh, vaccine comes from vaccinia, because milk maidens, it was discovered in Europe, when smallpox was sweeping through Europe, the milk maidens who were exposed to cows would get cowpox, these little sort of black blisters on their hands, but they were immune, it was found out, from smallpox. And so that knowledge was observed, was, it was carried forth, and one good physician made the observation, and I'm sure the ladies did too. And so they found that if they could take the cowpox scabs, they could actually confer an immunity against smallpox. Now, the, we must not forget the U.S. government and the British government were actively involved in bioterrorism against indigenous peoples. And Native Americans in the Northwest and in North America in general have no history of raising cattle, so they had no exposure to cowpox. So those of us from European backgrounds, if there was a smallpox epi uh, epidemic, 30% of us would die, 30% of us would become blind, 30% of us would be horribly maimed, maimed uh, and scarred, and 10% of us would survive without any, uh, any effect. With Native Americans, over 90% of them would die. And so as the militarization of the West Coast occurred, and the Brits and the United States were in competition, but they both held in common the secret biological weapon, oftentimes carried with blankets, and unfortunately at the time of signing of treaties. They realized that this warrior elite of Native Americans, they were oftentimes positioned at military strategic ports of entrance where rivers would flow into the ocean, uh, that's where the settlements were. That's where the salmon was coming. That's where the bears would come down. It was lowlands, and so the winters were not as severe. It was rich in all sorts of food. 
Well, the military realized, the U.S. and British governments, that they could not, they would lose a lot of their soldiers if they fought the Indians in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Indians were experts at guerrilla warfare. They lived and grew up in the old growth forest. They knew how to use the old growth forest, whereas the Brits and the Americans did not. So they found that if they sent in smallpox contaminated blankets or individuals into these communities, in a year's time, they could walk into the villages and not have to fight. A good friend of mine is Gu Zhao, who's the president of the Haida people, of the Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. The Haida Gwaii and the Haida people don't like to call it the Queen Charlotte Islands, the Charlotte Islands, because that was the name of the ship that brought in the smallpox. Mm. Gu Zhao, people also revered this mushroom. Again, it was associated uh, 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 primarily, not exclusively, but with women shamans. And grave guardians would be carved from this mushroom and placed on, these, uh, uh, on the shaman's graves. And that would help them carry uh, into the afterlife to fight evil spirits. And so Gu Zhao's people did not know that this mushroom was active against smallpox. And he told me if they did, they wouldn't have lost 50,000. Their population of the Haida Gwaii Islands would not have gone from 50,000 to less than 500 in three years. As it turns out, when we boil this mushroom, much in the same way that we boil this mushroom, the anti-pox properties are lost. But when we take a piece of tissue from the mushroom and we grow it in a petri dish and using a specialized technique, the anti-pox properties are preserved. We have now tested this against a number of other viruses. And now we have found that this mushroom is active against at least six viruses, three pox viruses and three other viruses that many people uh, are aware of. And so I believe this is one example where nature has within it remedies heretofore undiscovered. That even the 2,000 years of use by humans, we are still discovering new things about things that we already thought that we, we knew all about. And I believe that we should save the old growth forest as a matter of national defense. It's a unifying argument. And when I presented this to some conservative friends, and my family is very conservative, they cheer. They go, oh my gosh, this makes perfect sense. Osama bin Laden does not have an old growth forest, but we do. And now we're down to less than 4% of the original old growth forest, and this species is at the brink of extinction. It's so important that we get this into culture and we preserve the genome, because if we lose the biodiversity within this species, we may be losing the, the very strains that are essential for protecting millions of humans. To put it in perspective, in 1942, a lady in Peoria, Illinois, a housewife, sent in a moldy cantaloupe to a U.S. Defense Department ho uh, Army hospital. Upon the request of the U.S. government to Americans to send in your moldy fruit, an odd request, you know, I, I admit. But she, her moldy cantaloupe gave rise to the strain of fungus that produced the most potent uh, uh, form of penicillin heretofore seen, Penicillium chrysogenum strains which were already known, could not be industrialized. But her moldy cantaloupe strain gave rise to a strain that was 200 times more potent than anything they've seen and allowed the US and the British to produce penicillin as the antibiotic for treating battlefield wounds. The Germans and the Japanese did not have penicillin. The Americans and British did. One class of battlefield wounds, 90% of the soldiers would die from infection. After the introduction of penicillin, 90% of them would survive a huge influence, and it speaks to the importance of biodiversity. Now, this mushroom does not enjoy the widespread um, plasticity of the distribution of a cantaloupe. It is limited in the old growth forest. What else is out there? And I think this is the tip of the iceberg and speaks to the importance of biodiversity and that these fungi have evolved for billions of years now uh, and being in direct molecular communication with this environment and producing uh, uh, antibiotics and strategies of survival that we can, um, for lack of a better word, capitalize upon. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that this mushroom all is not active directly against viruses, but the mycelium is. And the mycelium uh, is only one cell wall thick, and it forms these fibrous membranes like cobwebs, and they're all around you all the time. And a single cubic inch of soil, there's more than eight miles of these cells. Every time you take a step uh, in a woodlands, you're stepping on 300 miles of mycelium. Uh, it's everywhere. And it's decomposing wood, and as it decomposes the wood, it liberates gases, 
and it forms microcavities where all these other organisms uh, live. And these microcavities become wells for storing water. And so when the mycelium infuses through a substrate, it has the ability of holding water longer, which of course benefits all the other organisms in the biological community, prevents erosion. So what's so amazing is that after hundreds of millions of years of evolution, you know, we are multicellular. I have six skin layers before you get to the inside approximately. The mycelium has one. And yet on the very opposite side of that cell wall are hundreds of millions of microbes trying to eat it. How does the mycelium with one skin layer prevent these microbes from eating it and if the mycelium achieves the largest mass of any organism in the world? How does it do that? It's because it's a very sophisticated and yet unknown properties of this membrane that's in constant biomolecular communication with the outside environment, developing strategies and producing antibiotics, antiviral compounds, antiprotozoal compounds, preventing microbial parasites from ingesting it. At the same time, it creates this mantle, this fabric, this mycelial matrix that becomes the foundation of the food web. So the mycelium, as it's producing these antibiotics, we can benefit from them. It is well known that if you get a fungal infection, the antifungal antibiotics that we have at our disposal tend to be toxic to you. And the reason why they're toxic to you is you have a more common ancestry with fungi than you do with other organisms like bacteria. We have very excellent antibacterial antibiotics coming from fungi that are not harmful to us because of that same relationship. We share the more common ancestry with fungi. So how does this work in the environment then? This means that you can project mycelial membranes and customize them to the microbial contaminants that are maybe present in the, in the environment. Whether it is uh, a West Nile virus or uh, malaria being uh, transported by insects but thriving in swamplands, you can create mycelial membranes that become microfiltration uh, filters that then are exuding these natural antibiotics, keeping the populations of these viruses and bacteria in check. And so I espouse or I'm a, a voice for uh, the concept of mycofiltration and using mycelial membranes in the environment in order to influence downstream health of habitats by mitigating these disease vectors. Now it goes much further than that because the mycelium produces enzymes and acids that break down plant cell walls. And these plant cell walls are held together by carbon-hydrogen bonds. Well, the exudates from the mycelium, the sweat that this produces, this dig these digestive enzymes, also break down hydrocarbons. And so my work and my experimentation and that of other people around the world have confirmed that the mycelium from these mushrooms can break down diesel, pesticides, PCBs, dioxins. And what's unique about mushroom mycelium, that's very different than mold mycelium, as mushroom mycelium is, is primarily forest fungi, forest mushrooms, they become vast in size. Mold mycelium tends to be very small. The colonies being epicentered on an insect, for instance, the locality of evolution is relatively small. Forests are thousands of acres, and so fungi that produce mushrooms grow to thousands of acres in size. This gives us a ready ability to tap into this powerful inherent resource that mushroom mycelium has to remediate environments, prevent downstream pollution from microbes, from viruses, you know, including, uh, including bacteria, protozoa, and also for breaking down a wide assortment of polluted, uh, pollutants. And this is one of the pedestals of mycorestoration, using mushroom mycelium in order to heal environments because these are truly healing membranes. And we walk upon these membranes daily, but their structure and the ability of these membranes to survive is largely unexplored. We do know symbiosis is absolutely critical, and these fungi that grow in these environments have all sorts of other microbial plant and animal allies that you know, hold this whole fabric together. And again, we don't know what happens if we lose you know, this, some of these citizens in this biological community before the whole system unravels. I have a question okay. off of this. This is great. Does the mycelium run under, let's say, asphalt? Like, does it, yeah. if, if there's a mat, let's say, here in this house, in this backyard, is it running under all these houses and maybe crossing the street underneath in the ground? Is it health? It can't do that? It can't survive these mm. kinds of urban zones? Or is it only in the forest? There's much more fungal diversity in ecosystems which have a lot more plant debris. 
So if you go to desert ecosystems versus a northwest old growth forest, there's a lot more fungal mycelium in the duff of the old growth forest than there is in the sand in, in a desert. But the mycelium has an amazing ability in that it, it can be running diffusely and it's a water transport mechanism that can uh, move water over great distances. So there can be a single threads of mycelium that can channel hundreds of gallons of water over hundreds of feet. And so mycelium does grow under uh, roads and there's great examples of shaggy mane mushrooms breaking asphalt. And several highways in the United States have had to be rebuilt because shaggy mane mushrooms, which you can crush in your hand, but because of a helical explosion and this polysaccharide matrix as the mushroom forms, it explodes over four or five days and in doing so produces so much force, it'll crack asphalt and concrete. This is just one of the many examples. These are, they're not, you know, they're, we move very quickly. Uh, uh, plants don't seem to grow that quickly, but mycelium is somewhere in between. And mycelium is moving anywhere from one to four inches per day. It can be less than that, it can be more than that. But these are mycelial mats that are projecting all the time, infusing landscapes. And as a result, there is this merging and through, uh, throughputting of mycelial mats going in between each other. And there's alliances and associations. After the great asteroid or comet strikes, uh, the fungi that paired up with plants, many of those became mycorrhizal fungi and the mycorrhizal fungi, and indeed now you cannot define any plant without its fungal associates. Plants do not exist on this planet alone. Plants are always in association with fungi. Endophytic fungi that are infused through the stems and the leaves that prevent insects from parasitizing them. Mycorrhizal fungi that are associated with the root zones that extend the root zones by more than a hundred fold in many cases. And also gives a host defense to the plant preventing parasites fungal parasites, bacterial, insects, etc. And, and as a result, by capillary action, and it's basically an extended root system, it brings in a lot more nutrients. Uh, the parasitic fungi, thought to be the bane of foresters. Well, indeed, it climaxes forests that don't have good host defense systems. And what does it do? It builds more soil for the next generation. And through this learning process of natural selection, the plants, in a sense, develop uh, a smarter methods of being able to prevent parasites. And so parasitic fungi, once thought to be uh, you know, uh, bad diseases of the forest, now by the, the most advanced eco-foresters and forestry scientists are looked upon a larger picture as being the part, part of the natural cycle of being, bringing ecosystems back into equilibrium. Can you talk about how mushrooms can eat VX gas as one of our, or excuse me, VX sarin. chemical sarin, sarin, and how we can use mushrooms to get rid of chemical weapons. Okay. I was involved with Battelle Laboratories for five or six years and they surveyed my strains um, for their effects against a wide variety of toxins. I did not know it at the time, uh, but they were also contracted by the Defense Department and they challenged, as they call it, my strains against a number of toxins, including nerve toxins. Uh, one is called DMMP, uh, dimethylmethylphosphonate, which is the core constituent in VX and somin and sarin. And uh, VX is a potent neurotoxin, as somin and sarin is. Um, and Saddam Hussein did use it and killed over 20,000 Kurds in a matter of three days through aerial bombardment of this, uh, of the, of this very potent nerve uh, toxin. One of the strains, again, from the old growth forest, dephosphorylated VX in a heretofore unprecedented fashion. This got a lot of attention. It was published in Jane's Defense Weekly. A number of internal papers were also produced. It actually became kind of sort of a black box, but the fungi produced a, a unique enzymatic system, this one strain that I had, heretofore unseen in the degradation of a toxin that otherwise was very recalcitrant and that could not be broken down. Once these fungi unravel these big molecular complexes into their subunits, then all sorts of other organisms and other sorts of enzymatic systems can come into play to further break them down. So they're otherwise very, very resistant to rot or decomposition, same thing. And what the fungi do is begin to break those essential molecular bonds, especially phosphorus bonds, in this case with VX. And by doing so, the rest of the VX uh, molecule dis uh, begins to, to disintegrate. Mushrooms also have a very bizarre property of hyperaccumulating heavy metals. This came up after Chernobyl, uh, the, 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 when, the, when, the, when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster occurred and uh, a spew of radioactive uh, gas and fallout covered uh, a large swath of uh, Western Europe, 
Geiger counters went off all over Europe, and the uh, Ukrainians were immediately identified as having a, a nuclear disaster. Because the Ukrainians and Europeans are avid mushroom hunters, the question became, are these mushrooms safe to eat? Very valid question. So analysis were, began, were done in soil samples, and then mushrooms were analyzed. And lo and behold, what was discovered was something that was totally unexpected. There are some mushrooms that hyperaccumulate cesium-137 over 10,000 times the background contamination in the ecosystem. This is a phenomenal uh, concentration from far away of these uh, heavy metal radioactive isotopes, which are toxic to almost all forms of life. And they'll concentrate them into by the, by the mycelium, which is everywhere. So when you find a mushroom that could be sorted by a mycelial mat that's acres in size, the mushroom is just the tip of the iceberg. The radioactive seed, in this case, cesium-137, with a mushroom called the hideous scomphidius, scomphidius glutinosus, actually the mushroom becomes radioactive and it detoxifies the ecosystem. Now, why would nature design something like that? And this, I think, is the, is the real point is these fungal systems have a long-term view of population, sustainability, and health. And they want the community of the forest to survive so more trees can be produced, more debris trails, more gomphidious glutinosis can grow. By detoxifying the ecosystem so the other plant communities and animals can survive is in its own best interest. And I think this is a model of how we should behave. What I hear in my dreams is generations in the future screaming back to us in time, saying, what are you doing? Don't you see? We are at this critical point in time, and we've evolved to be the leaders of our biological community, and we are misleading. We are, we are causing the devastation to our very foundation of our life system that has given us birth, and we are ultimately committing suicide. One spectacular and unfortunate example my wife Dusty and I went to China, to Shanghai, um, last March. And I was in China in 1984. This is uh, last March, this is, uh, you know, over 20 years later. And I came back with immediately the, the impression and the concept that China is committing ecological suicide. Shanghai is, inc is incredibly anemic biologically. Uh, now the sudden um, interest in owning automobiles personally and the amount of pollution and air pollution there is just out of control. So I'd like you to read something that uh, an ecologist wrote me just recently after seeing my book. And he wrote me something that I think really puts this into focus. So I'd like to read it just for a second. This is very, very potent. And I, I just, shivers went up and down my spine when this person re re uh, wrote this to me. So this one nuclear mushroom, basically. So out of this whole mycophilial map, there's basically one mushroom that's, that's no. There's, there's now there's hundreds of them that we know. That, but but in this there's case, one particular yes. There's like in a small area, maybe a couple of mushrooms that are basically highly nuclear reactive, and they're just sitting there. They're just growing. Okay, you want, that's incredible. Do you have a picture of that? Maybe? Yeah, I have photographs of it, not glowing in the dark. But you know, the idea would be. Um, well, why would that be advantageous? Another thing, well, a deer could come along, pick up the mushroom, yeah. go four or five miles away, and, you know, yeah. poop it out. Exactly. The environment's been detoxified to a large degree. Yeah. Now you repeat that over generations and generations of ecosystems you know, maturing and climaxing, and then what happens eventually is that the environment is detoxified. So I think these fungi take a long-term view um, this email comes um, to me from an ecological habitat restorator employed uh, by an international agency and received an award actually in habitat design. And he is over there trying to develop ecological parks. Um, in, Asian culture is in love with, with nature. And unfortunately, uh, capitalism in China uh, and elsewhere in the world has, has now trespassed upon natural systems to the point that is having a devastating effect. And so here's what he wrote. Um, this, is, this is around Shanghai is where he's located. Despite China's wonderful soil profile from glaciation and alluvial deposits, the central and eastern regions of the country appear to, to be devoid of fungi, devoid of worms in the soil, devoid of frogs in the creeks and insects in the air. Only in the steep mountainous wilderness areas where it is too steep to farm, you will find such biodiversity. Let's amplify this over the entire planet. Let's take Shanghai, it could be New Jersey. This is a growing disease that's 
expanding over the surface mass of the planet. If you put a glass bubble over Shanghai, would it be sustainable? No. It's not outputting enough nutrients and oxygen. It's not sustainable. It's been artificially supported. This, unfortunately, humans are literally becoming a disease blight on the ecosystem of the planet. Unless we rein in and start looking downstream, you have a responsibility for your grandchildren's 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 future. Are you being responsible with the heritage that you're supposed to pass downstream? Or are you taking it all for yourself in your lifetime because you think Armageddon's going to come and it doesn't matter anyhow? So why don't we talk about, right now I have a couple of questions, but why don't we talk about how worried are you? I mean, where are we in, in sort of this trajectory of the way we do business here on this planet? And how concerned are you with what may happen to us and the planet? You know, paranoia is a good thing when, uh, to help guide you when you don't know of the threats that are around you. And you can't discern exactly what they are, but I think we have a very clear understanding now that there's a tremendous loss of biodiversity. And the loss of species in our biological community is the foundation of the food web that will begin to unravel and is unraveling. How concerned, and I have two different, I'm sort of schizophrenic on this, I have two different attitudes. Well, what the heck, the human species has had its time in history, it'll be a footnote you know, in the, in the galactic encyclopedia, and, and this, the human species uh, didn't get sacked together, so it became extinct. Onward and upwards with other communities that would become smarter uh, over time. That's, that's kind of the big view. The short view is I have a grandson. I want to make sure that he grows up in a healthy and happy life. And I think we have a responsibility for future generations. The loss of biodiversity is something that we can't even estimate. And the difficulty that we face now is any estimations that we have are probably totally inadequate to the problems that we cannot yet see. And that's what I fear. And I'm not going to be an alarmist, but you take the example of Shanghai and you see it spreading. You take the example of anywhere in the industrialized world. And as the deforestation, hey folks, we're getting rid of the oxygen producers on the planet by cutting down the forests and you need oxygen. So I often thought, maybe in the future, there'll be an export tax. I live in Washington State. Washington State should be charging Arizona for its oxygen. Because oxygen is not being produced in Arizona, it's overpopulated, it's ex exceeded the carrying capacity of its environment. Now, obviously, that's, that's, I'm not being serious, but, but there is this, this balance in checks, and there is a spreadsheet. And we are on the debit side a lot more than on the credit side. And as the ecosystems do become more imbalanced, then there's going to be a catastrophic loss of species. And this is what many ecologists, not just myself, but a voice of people highly concerned, highly skilled, very knowledgeable in their specialties, are all being unified in their expression of concern. How long do you think we have and what do we need to do to turn this around? How long do we have before we have catastrophic failure? Um, since shamans have already stated they think it's too late, I, I'm not going to go there. I think that with the power of mycelium and understand how these fungal networks work, they, they move very quickly, they respond very quickly to catastrophia, they've been designed by nature to do so. So I think they can repair these ecosystems very, very quickly, provided the world gets involved. And, um, you know, you know, I don't want to harp on my own book, but I wrote this book, Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. It is a manual for the mycological rescue of the planet. It is how to engage fungal systems to heal ecosystems from pollutants. And it is my most significant work, and I hope it will open up doors for generations downstream. How much longer do we have? Depends on the ecosystem. Uh, China is trying to replant trees. Well, you know, I praise that. I think that's a wonderful thing. In, in to the extent that they can replant trees uh, versus the devastation that is growing, I don't think it's, it's, it's even a, a drop in the ocean in terms of what's needed to be done. The ecosystems are, are fragile in many areas of the world and may have been devastated beyond immediate repair. I think ultimately over hundreds of years the ecosystems can be repaired. But the only way that we can save this planet or save ourselves from extinction. And I think we'll go extinct before the planet will. 
um, is to get communities of individuals together. And we need to empower environmental scientists, empower biologists. Environmental sciences should be, be taught at kindergarten from the very beginning, and students need to be taught from the very beginning that every action, every footprint they make on this planet has an effect on nature. And without that knowledge, I don't have much hope for the human species. I do have the hope of the fact that nature will rebel and then exclude us as a member of the biological community if necessary, uh, if we don't get our act together. Why do you think we are committing this suicide? Why do you, what, what is it about a human that prevents us as a general collective from acting sustainably in our environment? What do you think are the prime motivators that can help us conduct our behavior this way? I have to be careful because my mother is a charismatic Christian and she's a Christian leader. Just do it. Just do it. So, um, your mother's not right No, she is not, but she'll watch this, I'm sure. So, <laughs> hi, Mom. She'll be supportive. <laughs> she'll be supportive. Um, I think we have a, a um, we were forest people, and we, we worshipped in the woods, and we relished and celebrated nature. Uh, we all have a sense of our own mortality, and the idea of an afterlife is something that most cultures share in common. So, with the rise of monotheism, the belief in one god and other gods are evil, uh, and this materialistic system of churches requiring the parishioners to give money to the church so the church can build bigger buildings and bigger, you know, congregations, and, and, and then the politicization of, of the religious movement uh, by the right is really causing us a lot of harm. We need to celebrate our diversity, our diversity in religious beliefs, our diversity in biological systems. My mother's a charismatic Christian, and I love her dear, dearly, and she's a good woman. And um, I think most everybody on this planet, I would say 98% of the people on this planet, uh, believe in the virtue of what is good. What, you know, is uh, we want things that make us happier and healthier. We want our children to be ha happier and healthier. I think that's a, almost a universal. Uh, but putting those into practice is, I think, where we fail. And my, I had this epiphany, and I was this whole thing about, uh, um, about the teaching evolution in, in the school and whether evolution or intelligent design should be taught as on equal footings. And I had this epiphany, well, it makes perfect sense. Evolution is God's intelligent design. There's two things that we can accept. I think most religions will accept. We are incapable of comprehending the enormity of the concept of God. Whatever it is, we know that we're incomplete and we can't even imagine the enormity of the concept. And two, we have evolved and we're born from nature. And if we claim that we are intelligent, how could nature not be intelligent? And yet, if we acknowledge that our intelligence is inadequate, inadequate to the concept of God, then we are still children on the, on, in, in the ecosystem. And we should be extremely careful because as we move forward in time and with our technologies, we are truly Neanderthals with nuclear weapons. We better step back, take a breath, look around, and consult with our microbial allies. We have to come into alliance with the microbes that have given us life. Can you go into the spirit, the forest people, and the mushrooms that we ate to expand our... Yeah, see, now we're starting to trespass into, into some private stuff that I'm, I'm not sure if I really want to go too far. Okay, you don't... I mean, could you, I'm, I could talk about things that will really, really, really blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about, would you want to talk about the practice of ingesting mushrooms to connect to a wider perception of the shamanic ritual? Yeah. I wrote the book on this, but I... Yeah. <laughs> see, my, my, my sensitivity right now is... Um, well, we have ceremony and ritual for helping us understand, you know, religious concepts. And Native peoples, in particular, you know, my limited familiarity with Native Americans, I would use that model and expand upon their knowledge base. One of the, the 
best things that I've ever heard from the Native American community is the concept of seven generations. If we could, you know, they should get the Nobel Prize for communication if there was such a one, uh, because this is something that I think that we all need to pay attention to. I hear nature screaming out to me, saying, wake up, don't you see? You know, we are your allies, we are your friends, but you have been given a position of honor which is being abused. And I sense that we have become deafened to the voices of nature because of our technology, the immediacy of personal gratif gratification, because of the fog of politics and war in the media, and that it's time for us to go back to nature. How many people, how many Americans have spent a night in an old growth forest? And then policies being dictated by people who've never spent a night in the old growth forest? You're supposed to be experts on the subjects that you make decisions about. And if you aren't experts, your decisions are obviously inadequate to the task. I sense that the environment in which that has given us birth, so many of us need to go back, you know, to experience that which our, our ancestors were very much a part of. And the disconnect that we have now is that we're speeding, you know, into uh, obliviously into our, our own demise. Mushrooms have engaged us as vectors for transport. We transport spores. Every time that we shake hands, every time that we get in an automobile, every time we mail a letter, we're sending spore mass, you know, over great distances. Mushrooms realize that insects, which are animals, and animals are good ways of carrying spores to different locations. The spores are like dust or like pollen, you know, they can go over great distances. Uh, but oftentimes two spores have to come together before there's a mating, before there's a successful mushroom colony remote from the source of the parent mushroom. Well, something that I discovered, and other people discovered as well, which is fabulously interesting and fun that anyone can do, is if you go into the woods and you find a mushroom that you like, you know, and obviously don't ever eat a mushroom without an expert identifying it, you know, that uh, goes without saying, I think. But if you find a mushroom that you really want to cultivate, you, I found that when you pick the mushroom up, at the base of the stem are all these roots, and it's a miraculous uh, property of these mushrooms that if you cut the stems, the stem base, the bottom of the mushroom, which everyone does before they eat them, they throw the stem base away. Well, guess what? The stem base regrows into mycelium. And so I thought about well, how is this? This is very interesting. It's like a proximity method for, for spreading the, the colony not using spores. Well, then I thought, you know, deer and bear and, and all sorts of other animals, you know, raccoons and uh, squirrels and voles, lots of animals eat mushrooms. Let's take the deer example. The deer come along, they see a mushroom, they, they love mushrooms, they bite the mushroom. They pull it up and they chomp on it, but they won't eat the dirt. What do they do? The base of the stem drops off as they walk away, falls into the ground and it re-sprouts. And so stem butt inoculation methods which is what we call them, is taking the, the butts at the base of the stem is an excellent way of propagating mushrooms and then allowing uh, you to carry natural spawn from the woods and plant it in your backyard. Okay? And the book's full of that. The book has all the visuals. And the last, I guess, is why don't we end with you think, giving us a vision for how we should live? You, you okay. Yep. Vision. Yep. Create a vision which would, instead of being angry, you would be elated. Yeah. Yeah. What, what does that look like okay. for us? And then we can close. Okay. What I see as the solution, and I'm speaking from a mycocentric point of view. Obviously, I'm I'm specialized in fungi, but from what I know thus far, with my limited knowledge is I really believe that mushroom farms should be reinvented as healing art centers for the communities. They are recycling all sorts of waste material. They're producing a medicinal or a, a food product that has great properties. But the enzymes that are present inside the straw and the sawdust and the other material they use, the compost, those enzymes are extremely powerful for breaking down toxic waste. We need to harvest those enzymes and those, those substrates that are fully myceliated with different species and then replant them in the outside uh, 
ecosystems surrounding communities that need attention, that need to be healed. And by then integrating mushroom farms and cultivation facilities, and this is just from micro uh, cultivation facilities of a home grower in their backyard, you can customize and orchestrate mycological communities, communities of mushrooms that are specific to the needs of your family, of your community, of the ecosystem, whether the issues are health-related, cancer, antivirals, antimicrobials, or whether you just need to build soil, preventing erosion. You know, you can take these mycelial mats and these mushroom farms are producing hundreds of tons of this material per week and they can't give it away. And it's right centered oftentimes around population uh, uh, communities, communities of populations that are in sorely of need of these. So I think in integrating these into permaculture systems, into these, inter, in, integrating these into Christian communities, Buddhist communities, this is an, an essential piece of the puzzle that is missing. And this essential piece of the puzzle can be a catalyst for a paradigm shifting change for benefiting the future. And they work quickly and they can work now. And it's 20, 2100. And okay. what do you want to tell those people from okay. there, given what you know now, obviously? Okay, I'm speaking w to generations way beyond my own lifetime. And I like to say that we tried. Many of us tried. What I would like to tell future generations is to always remain children in your scientific curiosity and to explore nature to its greatest depths, because we are a part of a natural system. We are children of nature. And in order for us to sustain ourselves into the future, we need to stay in that, in that state of bewilderment, of amazement, of curiosity, of passion, of sensitivity to the health needs of everyone around us. So my path has been the mycelial path, and I know it fairly well. There's so much more that I need to know, and I'm hoping that future generations can pick, pick up the torch and pass it on. So. Beautiful. Thank okay. you.